Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geomologist Presents. I got a good show for you today. Today, or this week, on the podcast, I'm going to talk about BSRCon 3 and my participation. I ran two games, and I played in two. I also was able to run a game of Savage Worlds on Saturday night, and we put that on the YouTube. I'll put a link in the show notes, which was really fun. I ran that for uh, my wife and a friend of ours, and uh, so it was a really good weekend of gaming. So I'm going to definitely talk about that. I have a couple call-ins, one from Jason Connerly and one from a first-time caller, apparently long-time listener, Dark Fluid. So he gives a call-in, which is pretty cool. And that one is in giving me good luck, wishing me, give me good luck. Well, if you wish me good luck, I guess you give me good luck. But then the other one is about uh, the Love is a Battlefield podcast from a couple weeks ago, or in reference to that, it's pretty, pretty cool um, what uh, Dark Fluid says. So... And then um, I'm going to talk about not just BSRCon 3 participation, but just like, an, um, I guess, an introduction of our new game that we're going to play for the home group. We finished the Alien RPG Chariot of the Gods, a one-shot cinema, I guess it's called cinema-style scenario. It went out, down with a bang, out with a bang, which was pretty cool. Um, I'm not going to really talk about that too much. Chariot of the Gods is a really good starter. It's in the starter set. Um, if you did the Kickstarter, you have it as well. It's a really cool starter set. Very fun. The map is really neat. I love that kind of uh, blueprint type map that they have of the uh, main ship that you're on board. So uh, anyway, yeah, um, pretty cool. But And you know what? I got this heavy package today. Uh, so I'm going to open it here in the intro. So I guess if you want to skip, you could probably skip ahead. I would guesstimate about five minutes or so, or at least until the music break, maybe. And if you don't like that, but I don't even know what it is. It's from Riot Minds AB out of Sweden. Um, I know I've done all these Kickstarters. So, uh, so yeah, here's the measurements for you. The measurements are, it is uh, 35 centimeters or 13 and three quarter inches long. And the width is about 24 centimeters or nine and a half inches. And it is a parcel that is about five centimeters. Is that right? It says two inches, five centimeters. I guess that's about right. Uh, thick. And does it have a weight? Maybe a weight? Oh, yes. 2.5 kilos. So that's pretty substantial. That's about almost six pounds. Um, five and a half pounds, right? So... 2.2, 2.5 times 2.2, uh, yeah, five and a half pounds or so. So I open it. I'm scaring my cat Jewel as I use the box cutter, not because I'm almost cutting myself, but this doesn't like the sound that you heard. And uh, it's in a shrink wrap and then an inner box. You can just tear, which you can hear. Fun stuff. And what do we got in here? Uh, quite a few things. Um, wow. Okay, I didn't realize. Maybe I must have done, I don't know, these, sometimes these Kickstarters are from a couple years ago. I don't remember. Um, a time when I was flush with money. Anyway, this is the World of Kensei. It's a 5e version um, of the fantasy rule set for the World of Kensei. It's an Asian-inspired world. And the book itself is in a slipcase. So I'm going to open that. The world of Kensei book. It's a nice red slipcase cover, so I guess you can protect protect your assets, your book. Uh, the book itself comes nicely out of the slipcase, pretty sturdy slipcase. And um, the book itself is about 172, 173 pages or so. And the world of Kensei, the land of dragons. Uh, Kensei player options, the world of Tatsu, monsters and inhabitants, and then places, uh, which is pretty cool. So, a pretty succinct book. Um, it looks like it has how to put elves, dwarves, and humans, uh, Venara, Moon Touched, uh, new types of classes, so there's a Bushi class, and then it gives you the history of the world, etc. So, 
It, is, it looks like Japan with some islands or adjacent places. Um, it does have stylings of Japan. So, yeah, pretty much it does look like that. So pretty interesting. I, d I definitely like the art. It's evocative. It is different. It seems like an amalgamation of Japan, China, and other uh, Asian places. Uh, you know, some of the more southeasterly places as well, southeasterly Asian countries. So, um, looks pretty cool, I think. So, when we get it to the table, that remains to be seen. I have a lot of 5e stuff I'm currently running. Eberron 5e. Uh, so, we'll see. Let's see what else we got in here. We got, it looks like, World of Kensei character sheet stack. A World of Kensei. I got a uh, dice roller thing that you put, to, you kind of snap together. Let's see, I got um, some cards. Looks like some art that you can show, like 8 by 10 art pieces that you can show. And I got um, the World of Kensei. There's like a book here. Is this an intro adventure? This booklet? No, it's like a little art book. It looks like that you can show to players. It's about a 16, 20 page art book. Then World of Kensei, Scroll of Wukong. Perhaps this is like an intro adventure. It is also in shrink wrap. If you can hear the shrink wrap. Scroll of Wukong by Riot Mind. And it seems to be an adventure. Yes, adventure background consisting of one, two, three, four chapters. Um, yeah. And then an appendix with new items and a small bestiary. So, so this one's pretty, pretty. It looks pretty dense, pretty nice. As I'm flipping through it, the adventure itself is about sixty pages or so. And then I guess since I did the deluxe or it got did really well on the uh, stretch goals, I, there, it looks like there's a GM screen as well. And this GM screen, you know what it does not have, which I appreciate? It does not have one of those useless back flap things. Um, it does have, oh, it has like little pogs, um, little standees that you can do. And inside is the map, sort of a poetic map of the world of Kensei. The, I guess the main island is called Kawashi. And then you have Wakun and Kamidana, uh, three islands at this kingdom consists of um, which is cool so pretty regional in scope which I do appreciate for like a short-term type of campaign um, it gives you it looks like there's about 31 uh, sort of a thing or parts of the uh, place 31 items uh, numbered on the map that have place names to them so there's probably a gazetteer in the main book for them uh, there's Simple and martial melee weapons, changes of the moon, I guess that's important, um, and ranged weapons. So it's just about weapons in the map, in the screen. So not so simple screen, I guess you would have this on uh, as well as your your D&D 5e screen handy, potentially. So it's mo mostly flavor stuff or stuff that's specific to the world of Kensei. So uh, there you go, the world of Kensei Kickstarter unboxing. All right. So uh, first up, I'm going to share the call-in. So the first up in the call-ins, we'll have Jason Connerly. Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Hey, Carl. Jason here. Just listen to episode 237. Excited for those games you're going to run at BSRCon. I look forward to hearing how they go. Sadly, my work schedule conflicted with BSRCon, so I had to withdraw from it. But I'm wishing you a lot of luck, and I again, I look forward to your, your recap of it. So best of luck on that. I'm glad you're getting more actual play stuff up. I know you're enjoying doing that. So hopefully that and the YouTube channel are working out well for you. And, and I have some other thoughts, but I'm about to get on somewhere I can't use my cell phone, so I'll I'll reach out to you later. Take care, and yeah, take care. Hey, Jason, thank you for that call. Yeah, I had a great time at BSRCon. I got to play in two games, 
like I had mentioned before, what the first game I got to play in was in Eric Saul's Weedles game that he called the Neon Showdown. And uh, Eric of Omega 3D Chicken Coop, uh, you can check out. I put a link in the show note. And I had a great time with this game. It's a game that he's working on. I don't want to see too much because he'll probably run it again. But I got to play a character named Javier Steel Palm Rodriguez. He knew Kung Fu, who's an older guy. Uh, and I really, the game really worked, I think, to get that sort of, uh, you know, I guess he was trying to go for the, I want Street Fighter vibe, you know, sort of the, and it, and it definitely worked. I love that we had three uh, stats, uh, speed, technique, and power. And, you know, you roll under, uh, you have a certain die for the damage. Uh, you have some, you know, hit, hit dice for key, which is like a usage dice, uh, a la black hack. And if you roll a one or a two, uh, then you have to, and then it goes down. Um, I really love the combos, and I felt like my character got to shine in the final boss fight. I got a couple combos where I was able to, where one character like held the bad guy, I was able to, uh, from being held, throw him. And then I got a combo on that throw, and then I dragon strike, dragon strike. You know, so it was, it was really cool, and I had a, a great time playing it. Had some really fun players. Uh, they We had evocative names like Iron Fist and Swift Blade, Thunderstrike, Whirlwind. You know, it's a... It's an Omega 3D Chicken Coop production. So you know uh, the GM, Eric, brings a lot of energy uh, to the table. And and it was late early in the morning on Friday, so we definitely needed the energy. And I'm really glad I played it. Uh, the other game that I played was run by Miro Gu. Um, and this was a game I have tried to run before and not very successfully. And I really liked the game, and that's Coriolis. And he ran the scenario, Hyenas of Otakon. And it's a great intro adventure. I'm probably going to... I think I picked it up, actually. I picked it up uh, on Mirogu's um, recommendation and the way it ran. It's a really good GM. He was really nervous because he's a first-time GM. But he did an awesome job. Um, I had really good players. And I felt it's a really good intro adventure for Coriolis because it really gets the feel of the verse. Uh, so... If you can imagine Arabian Nights in space, but it also has some sort of uh, some horror vibe. So a la Event Horizon, it has some Firefly vibe because you can be like cowboys plying the trade stars in a sort of short, uh, smaller universe. It's not as extensive or as big as Traveler. And there's like jump gates between worlds and, and the society and the art is very evocative in the game. I really enjoyed Coriolis. I put the link in the show notes. And it was a really fantastic game. I put a link for the adventure, too. So the two games I ran, um, I'll talk about those. And they were, the first game I ran was Armored Knights of the Brazos for T2K, 4th edition. Um, I put a link in the show notes for Free League Publishing. And that game, I thought, went really well. I had originally had this whole scenario planned out. And it was like a side quest in the original Red Star, Lone Star produced by uh, GDW back in the day for Twilight 2000 first edition. But the players uh, kind of ignored that and they ignored their orders that they were given by Milgov. So I had I kind of changed the premise. So in Red Star, Lone Star, it's kind of like a continuation of sort of the coming home to the U.S. cycle. Uh, you fly along the East Coast, eventually you get to the Caribbean. And from the Caribbean, you get to the Gulf Coast and then work your way into the Midwest and then, you know, across the heartland uh, and eventually to California, I believe, and back. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. Um, in any case, so I ran in like a side quest that's in there. It's like a little blurb. And it, it, like in the blurb in the Red Star Lone Star, it says, this scenario is, uh, or this potential scenario is beyond the scope of the current scenario and not part of the main plot. But here's the situation. And um, they didn't take that hook. They took the hook for the mainline adventure. Maybe I sold it too well. Um, maybe they felt, you know, let's let's not worry about, let's try to make allies first and then deal with the situation that we are intended to. And this was a great way to make allies. So it really did, um, so it's kind of an investigation and they get hired by someone in the area to do a job. 
uh, they had spent a, a good amount of time on the investigation. And, then I, and I did realize that um, if I were to run this again, because I think it's a good intro to a T2K and set up ca uh, campaign, it's a good jumping point for a T2K campaign based in Texas, in South Texas, especially. Um, there are, in the verse, right, uh, the Russians have invaded South Texas and pushed all the way to San Antonio. I think they were stopped just outside of Waco and had to fall back. And they were at, they allied actually with the Mexican army in that case, but the Mexico was in a civil war. Um, and it, you know, there's all sorts of disparate uh, groups of Mexican troops in South Texas that have loyalties to different political factions. It's really fun. It's a really great sandbox. And the player character has got to explore that sandbox a little, you know, following uh, the quest that they were on. Um, we had some really great, uh, we had a couple fights, a couple relatively quick fights, but they had a pretty relatively powerful weapon for the area. And that was like, you know, mate, that was like envy. It, it could cause envy depending on where they went. It could cause people to retreat. Uh, the, we had really some really fun players that kind of followed the, the adventure hooks and took the hints and the clues really well, which I thought was fantastic. And uh, they, I think um, clearly we did not finish the main scenario. Uh, that is probably like a two to four session scenario, depending on how the players push it or play it. Uh, and that would be like two to four or four hour session scenario. Um, depending on, again, how things go. But we came to a satisfying conclusion, I think, for the con game and that they found out that there was a turncoat um, in the mission um, and that was with them, actually, and they were able to capture him. There's some really good and dramatic scenes where he had shot the guy as he's trying to escape or uh, call down some enemies on them. And uh, then they had to scramble to pull out the med kit and roll with not so great skill to try to save him. It was it was really good. It was really cool. I love some of the some of the lines in this in the in that we had, and we had some really uh, dynamic players that played really well together. And I really enjoyed uh, that T two K pickup group and the dynamic of sort of this tank crew, well, an M three uh, Bradley crew and, and a couple adjuncts. So they had a I created the M three Bradley crew, and then uh, so the um, driver gunner commander the commander ended up being an npc um, but i didn't have him do much uh, so driver commander gunner uh, had a marine who was just an additional rifleman you know to kind of man the m4s that are inside but also if need be you know fire if he uses m16 uh, i had a dia agent sent from milgov who was also a sniper and i had a former local who was a member of a, a local uh, city or county police department and uh, and just kind of knew the area, uh, survived the nuclear explosions that were, over, you know, survived the nuking of Houston, basically, and was able to flee, uh, and eventually flee as a refugee and eventually made it and hooked up with these guys. Uh, so probably a very interesting uh, adventure, set of adventures and backstory over the course of a year for this uh, policeman who escaped. So it was good. It was a good group, um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we did have. I, I thought that it really the game was able to highlight, which is what I wanted. I wanted them to fire the big gun. Um, they had some. They had a couple, um, but very limited supply of ATGM, so anti-tank weapons, which they didn't need to use, but they could. They could have used if they had run into that type of opposition, which I thought was you know just in case, right? Um, and then and then they had their own personal weapons. Um, unfortunately, uh, the sniper did not get to fire their bear. Uh, or M95, uh, but a 50 cal sniper rifle, and uh, but uh, the other guys got to really you know shoot him up, and that was kind of kind of fun. Uh, so uh, <laughs> there's a fun little interrogation scene too, where they ran into some some local marauders, uh, took him out relatively easily, intimidated the hell out of them by even like firing the, a shell from the Bradley in front of them and blasting them back and hitting him with shrapnel. Um, it was, uh, yeah, kind of funny in a dark humor kind of way. So I thought I thought it went really well, and I'd love to. Um, I think one of the players said and was willing to play it again to start off a Texas-based Twilight 2000 campaign. Um, they said that it would be better to start from the beginning, so I didn't pick it up halfway. 
and then you know run with it and they would pretend not to know what was going on not make the decisions in the group or maybe it would go a different way and they do the original mission who knows right so uh so it's pretty pretty cool so uh that was twilight 2000 the other game i ran for BSRCon was what i'm calling plata oplomo and it is a variant of reaver the reaver up and coming the upcoming reaver rpg by joe salvador of raven god games i have all that stuff in the show notes as well and there is a reaver sword and sorcery rpg quick start and uh it's a really cool game i've run this a couple times at conventions or the base reaver i'm like well how would it work for a modern for a modern setting and this is definitely a play test but this session i had such good players in this session and this session i really wanted to get sort of a miami vice meets a team meets narcos type of feel and I think I got to tweak the Narcos a little bit, but the A-Team and Miami Vice vibe was totally there. The players really got into it and got into character, you know, played their characters' tails off. Uh, and it was a really fun showcase to show that the Reaver system can be used in a modern setting uh, with some help from fellow collaborators, Joe Salvador and Jason Connerly. We had uh, automatic weapons rules, and I thought they worked really well. Some players totally took advantage of it to test, to take it for a test drive, you know, opening fire, full auto and stuff like that. I think there's some granularity in that you'll still have ammo and not usage dice, uh, which, which I think is fine. And then we also attacked on a skill system, which Reaver doesn't really have. You get some like talents or feats uh, from, not really feats, you get some skills from your um, careers within your character class, but you don't have like skills per se, like traditional skill that you would see in a game but it's a modern game and i think it worked pretty well uh we probably have to tweak that a little bit maybe add a, a few i don't know if we need to add a, add more but maybe definitely explain when in a document if we were to push this further uh because i think it worked really well then as a dot in a document we need to define those skills a little better and i think i would need to tweak um so i believe joe has um and maybe maybe i messed up in that but maybe joe has D6, D8, D10 for small, medium, and large weapons. But I think I did D4, D6, D8. Joe, maybe I'm wrong and you can correct me on that, or I need to relook at the Reaver Quick Start um, or the document, the playtest document that we are working on for our ongoing playtest of Reaver, uh, which Joe runs. And uh, but uh, but yes, yeah, so I think I would increase the damage from the d4 to the d6 for small i think that would be more satisfying and give players a few more options maybe make like reserve d4 for like unarmed combat unless you have like a martial artist specialty which we would probably add in you know so much like reaver we have different like i said careers within each uh, class and our classes were combatant um combatant leader technician and specialist so we would have kind of career paths within that, and each career path would give sort of a talent. And I had some class feats that were available that the players really liked. I think they all used them. Well, the only one that didn't use them was the resolve mechanic, but then I, I realized that Joe has added uh, in the newest playtest document, he's tweaked the rules a little bit about recovering resolve, and I didn't implement that. So, so definitely have to go back with Joe and, and talk about this, and we still have to sit down and have our you know, our, um, kind of our debriefing discussion about uh, Plata Plomo and see how viable it really is. But I will say it was really fun to run and it was really fun to play and I had a great group of players. So uh, that's what we ran for BSRCon. Now, the other game I ran, I ran a Saturday Night Cinema for Savage Worlds. And you can actually see that actual play. It does. It is a spoiler because it is the final rest stop, a... Um, Scenario by Jared Goff for their Savage Saturday Cinema, or for Pinnacle's Saturday Sa Savage Saturday Cinema line. That they just come out as a companion to the horror companion for Savage Worlds. So I think it is a it's pretty it's pretty fun adventure. Uh, I, I got a comment already on the YouTube that, wow, you had a 100% survival rate. Were there a couple instances in there where the players aced in a certain key roles and uh, i think it was the same player aced certain key roles 
and then they were able to have their character survive. And they played it cautious, they played it smart, and they fled, um, which is what you do in a horror show, right? In a horror themed, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Depends. Uh, I ran uh, the other horror game I've run recently using the horror companion is like a Monster Squad. So imagine DCC Monster Squad. They got like you know, the vampire, the werewolf, the angel, the demon, right? And then these are sent into a basically an impossible mission, kind of like Suicide Squad, um, by your favorite or Joe Richter's favorite character in the DC universe, Amanda Waller. And uh, so, uh, yeah. I did Monster Squad with the Horror Companion, and this was like more. These are like teenage teenage horror movie. Uh, that was a vibe for the final rest stop. And I do recommend it. It's a pretty fun one shot, and you're able to finish it in a, about a two and a half hour, three hour slot. So I think it, it's pretty cool. Good for a convention or just for a one shot if you're interested in Savage World. So I put that link in the show notes too. It's a show note linky type of session podcast today. All right, so let me take a, a quick break, and, I, and then I will get into an intro to Bloodlords that I'm going to be running. It's a adventure path for Pathfinder 2, and it's a very different type of adventure path. But first, a message from a first-time caller. I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, let's hear from Dark Fluid. Hey, Carl, this is Dark Fluid. Uh, calling in from the road, I... I think when you were talking about quotes, the one that comes to mind that I was thinking of is, uh, well, the modern, <clears throat> the modern version of it, which is kind of a paraphrase, is that no plan survives contact with the enemy. But I believe the original source of that is uh, from a German field marshal known as uh, Moltke the Elder, um, and his actual quote was. No, uh, <clears throat> sorry, having to go past the fire truck. Uh, no plan of operations extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. So uh, keep listening. I'm um, sorry for any background noise. But talk to you later. Thank you for that message, Dark Fluid. I'm glad you've been listening. I'm glad you finally called in. And thank you for that quote. That's some great research there. I was trying to figure out the exact uh, quote. But you nailed it. And it's a pretty fun to kind of examine. We're having a great time with Twilight 2000. So so the quote is in reference. I was trying to, it was just such a great plan that the player characters executed. And I talked about it in my Love is a Battlefield podcast, which is the one from a couple times ago, number 236. And we had a great time running it. We've since run another uh, Twilight 2000 campaign. We have a new player on board. We have a character creation that we published about 10 days ago on YouTube. And we're going to have the live play introducing that character and kind of the, the sort of wrap up and clean up of this airfield uh, Operation Heinz Nest, Operation Heinz Cradle. That's what it is. Operation Heinz Cradle. And then they're going to push on to the next thing, which is they're going to, knowing that. Um, the local, the warlord who wants to take over Warsaw, has uh, bought some chemical weapons. They have learned of a convoy uh, where that is coming back, probably now to Warsaw, and they want to intercept it. So I think that should be pretty fun to do that. We'll see how the plan goes, and whether it also falls subject to that uh, maxim from. <coughs> From that general or that field marshal. So, what else is new? What else is next? Uh, Bloodlords. So, what is Bloodlords? Bloodlords is a it's a twenty third Pathfinder adventure path. It is created for Pathfinder Second Edition, and it is a six part adventure path. The undead nation. Here's a blurb. The undead nation of Geb gains most of its trade from the export of food grown on zombie-worked farms. But one farm has been the site of a series of strange occurrences. The Bloodlord's Adventure Path is a six-part monthly campaign which characters ride from skilled troubleshooters to join the Bloodlords who rule the land of the dead. And it takes place in a very interesting nation called Geb, and the ghost king of Geb rules a nation where living and undead work uneasily side by side. 
The power behind the throne, the true rulers of Geb, are the Blood Lords, a scheming, a scheming group of undying necromancers whose whims affect millions. Joining the Blood Lords isn't easy, but your band of less than good hearted troublemakers is destined to ascend their ranks for exposing a dangerous plot to the nation. The danger increases once your characters become Blood Lords as intrigues of the undead rulers are fiercest against each other. Powerful factions and ancient secrets are all playthings in the deadly trickery. Your blood lords must fight from the borders of the nation to the sepulchral halls of power to claim their authority over the land of the dead. So it looks pretty cool. Uh, the first one is called Zombie Feast, and here is a blurb for that. Something gnawing at you? The undead nation of Geb gains most of its international trade from the export of food grown on zombie work farms. Like I said earlier in the blurb for the whole path, one farm has been the site of a series of strange occurrences. So the characters are going to be dispatched to check out the problem. And then they discover a grave threat to Geb's minority living population, and it brings them to the attention of the insidious blood lords. So you got to defeat the wicked forces behind the plot is the first step on the long road to gain influence and power in Geb. But if the investors can't solve the problem, the Blood Lord's satisfaction, well, this first step may be their last. So it's a pretty interesting cast of characters. It's not your traditional campaign. I think that's why we're intrigued by it on my home group. And the characters, here's what we have. We're going to have a Dampier investigator. Dampier is a vampire blooded bloodlined character uh, we also have having a dampier witch then we're going to have a human or maybe a goron goron being a plant construct created characters from the neighboring country of nex or he's going to be a human duskwalker monk then we're going to have a human but hellspawn background rogue and a skeleton swashbuckler so i, I think it's pretty fun uh, what we're going to be doing uh, the characters don't all have to be good, but it really suggests that they're not uh, chaotic evil or even neutral evil, and that there are certain like champions, even champions of an evil type deity, um, or unholy. I guess I don't know if they've changed. I guess they changed good and evil to unholy, holy. I don't you know negative positive energy. Anyway, it's probably not a great idea because um, they could work end up working at cross purposes with each other, but that's okay. Uh, there's a uh, there's a whole player's guide for this. There's a series of background feats that um, lets them kind of have an entry or a foot in the door of the various factions. So there's all these blood lords that have their own agendas, and then there's the great factions uh, of the uh, the war the land. And these are interestingly include the following: there are the builders, the builders league. They're tradition bound architects and occultists. Then there are the celebrants, gluttonous priests overseeing public events and propaganda. Next, we have the export guild, managers of foreign trade, the reanimators, who the first patron of the adventure path that they're going to be in is from. So necromancers managing food production and labor. Then there's a tax collector's union. It's pretty interesting, right? Tax collector's union. And the tax collector's union are an ostentatious aristocrats and bankers. There's a host of lower factions as well, uh, such as the Carter's Consortium, which used to be a great faction. Uh, they're responsible for like transporting, um, transporting and shipping within the country. Then there are the uh, Bellator Mortis, the Mercator City Guard, the Clothiers, responsible for textiles, clothing, and faction. The Seven Signs, responsible for regulating magic outside, or aside from necromancy. So people could be uh have that and there's like faction play that's kind of the sub the, the pathfinder adventure pass always have sort of a sub game or a game within a game and faction play uh kind of wheeling and dealing gaining notoriety with blood the blood lords and these great factions helps you build reputation points which are used to gain favor etc as the campaign progresses so we're actually starting next thursday February February 2nd, so I'm looking forward to that, but I wanted to get you guys a preview of it out now uh, before well, before we started. So I think uh, that's I'm going to end it here, right? So thank you for listening. This has been The Geomologist Presents. If you would like to give me a call and leave a message, you can do that 
at uh, geomologist at gmail.com. Send me a voicemail message or type a message. Uh, I will say that, um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, there'll be other. I've gotten some great feedback on our Western stuff, and I'm trying to put that. Uh, Amy and I are doing like a series of Western stuff, and uh, if you left a message for that, it'll be on the when we do the wet next Western. And uh, I have a couple messages from that. Uh, you can leave a message on my SpeakPipe account. You can leave a message on Spotify for podcasters. So thank you, Jason and Dark Fluid, for leaving me a message. It's fun to interact. And thank you all for listening. The intro and outro music are by TJ Drennan. The cover of today's podcast is usually my wife Amy does the covers of the podcast, but today the cover of the podcast is the cover of Zombie Feast, and that cover is by Natasha Nanook. And I think that is it. Did I say TJ Drennan does the intro and outro music? If I didn't, thank you again, TJ, for the cool music. And good night and good rolling.